uh, committee will come to order. Uh, a quorum being present, uh, we are now in session. Today's session is a continuation of yesterday's hearing regarding Johnny Chung and his unusual access to the White House. Uh, before I welcome our guests this morning, I would like to say that the questions which will be asked uh, today uh, will not in any way be taken from uh, the uh, uh, interview we had with Mr. Chung this morning. Uh, we have agreed, uh, uh, Mr. Waxman, myself, and our staffs and our colleagues uh, to keep the contents of that uh, interview uh, confidential, and we will uh, abide by that agreement. Uh, we will be meeting with Mr. Chung later today to uh, go into it further, but at this time with our witnesses today, we will uh, refrain from uh, uh, raising any issues uh, that were raised in that confidential interview. I'd like to welcome uh, Brooke Darby. Uh, former executive assistant to uh, Nancy Solderberg at the National Security Council, and Robert Suttinger, former director of Asian Affairs for the National Security Council. Uh, we really appreciate your being here. Would you both stand to be sworn, please? You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you guys? Yes, I do. I do. Thank you. You may be seated. On behalf of the committee, we welcome you here today. Uh, you'll each be recognized if you so desire to give an opening statement of five minutes. If you have a statement that's longer than that, uh, we'll be happy to uh, insert that in the record. So uh, with that, uh, which one of you would like to uh, go first? I have no statement to offer, sir. Mr. No Chairman. You do not have a statement? I do not yet? have a statement, sir. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, we'll start with our investigative counsel, Mr. Rohrbaugh. Uh, we'll recognize you. Uh, for, uh, incidentally, uh, you have counsel with you? Yes, we do. Uh, would you want, like to introduce your counsel? This is Mr. John Sparks from the National Security Council. Mr. Sparks, uh, you're welcome to uh, assist your clients in any way uh, that you see fit. Uh, so we welcome you as well. Uh, Mr. Rohrbaugh. Uh, good morning, Ms. Darby, Mr. Sudinger, uh, Mr. Sparks. We met out in the hall briefly. Uh, I introduced myself out there. My name is Bob Rohrball, and I'm just going to ask some questions of you today. Uh, hopefully, we'll try to be brief so the members can uh, go back home. I'm going to start with you uh, briefly, Ms. Darby. Uh, could you briefly tell me your educational background and your work experience? Yes, I graduated in 1992 from Mount Holyoke College. Ms. Darby, uh, would you pull the microphone closer to you so we sure. can hear you clearly? Thank you. Sure. I graduated in 1992 from Mount Holyoke College. I'm currently pursuing a law degree in the evening division at Georgetown Law School. Uh, my first job after graduating was working for the campaign in Little Rock, Arkansas, the Clinton Gore campaign, where I worked as a foreign policy assistant in the foreign policy office. I later joined um, the transition team where I continued to work for Nancy Soderberg, who was uh, director of the transition in Little Rock for foreign policy issues. Um, thereafter, I joined the National Security Council staff working as Nancy Soderberg's, Soderberg's special assistant and then later as her executive assistant. And do you still work at the NSC? No, I don't. I currently work at the State Department in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. When you were employed at the NSC, to whom did you report? Nancy Soderberg. Who at the NSC would interact with the White House? Um, well, both of us interacted with the White House and both of us had a number of people who, did, who we had worked with on the campaign who later got jobs in the White House, and they would frequently call us uh, if they had any issues with foreign policy implications. Okay. And you're familiar with an email dated April 7th, which we're going to display at the present time. Very familiar, sir. Very familiar with that. You've been deposed before. You're very familiar with that email. Uh, first of all, uh, can you tell me what prompted your sending that email of April 7th that appears in front of you? Yes, I was approached uh, one evening by Kelly Crawford from the President's staff. She said, she basically conveyed the information that's in this email, which is that there had been a radio address approximately a couple weeks before. Uh, the Friday night before the radio address, the radio addresses are at 9 a.m. on Saturday mornings. Uh, a Friday night before, the president's office had gotten a request from the DNC that uh, the people on this list in the email be invited to the radio address, um, and they were invited. And as a routine part of the radio address, uh, the guests get their pictures taken with the president afterwards. It usually takes a couple of weeks for those photos to be developed. Those photos had been developed, uh, and Johnny Chung was coming in to see Nancy 
Kernreich the following day to pick up the photos, and she conveyed to me that the president had some concerns about um, us perhaps not wanting photos of him with the individuals circulating, uh, and asked for our guidance on whether we should, whether the president's office should give Johnny Chung the photos when he came to Nancy Hernrich's office the following day. Okay, and who uh, who asked for your guidance on that? Kelly Crawford. Okay, uh, in the past, uh, well, before I get to that, uh, prior to these individuals having actually come into the White House, had the NSC been asked to? vet or check out these individuals? With respect to the radio address? Yes, ma'am. Not that I'm aware of. She uh, indicated to me that, that they had not, because of the lateness of the rec request coming in on a Friday night before the radio address on Saturday morning, that contrary to their normal procedures, they hadn't had an opportunity to check the names with us first. Okay, so it was the normal procedure that especially when foreign nationals would come into the White House, the NSC would be asked to, to check or vet these people? Not necessarily. If, uh, if anyone had a concern about any of the individuals involved, then they would contact us. But it was not routine practice for us to vet the names of people coming to a radio address, for example. How often would this vetting be asked of the NSC by the White House? Uh, I don't think I probably handled all of the vetting, uh, but in terms of my own participation in the vetting process, I would, it's hard to quantify it, but I would guess probably uh, four to eight times a month if I had to guess, but that really is just an estimate. So it would not be unusual for the White House to actually ask the NSC to vet the people before they came in? That's right. Okay. Now, on exhibit number 196, that's in front of you? Yes. Your email? It starts off by saying, an odd situation developed. You see that phrase? Yes, I do. What was the odd situation that developed? The odd situation was that the president's office had some concern about these individuals, and they hadn't come to us in advance to ask for our guidance before these individuals were invited into the White House. And usually, if they had a concern about someone, they would make every effort to contact us first so we would have an opportunity to comment before the individuals were invited. Okay, and if I can, in the second paragraph, it says they, which I believe refers to the President's office, did so not knowing anything about them except that they were DNC contributors. Did you know anything else about these individuals other than they were DNC contributors? I didn't know anything about them, sir. I, I tried to convey the information that, that Kelly Crawford had offered to me. I, I presume she used the term DNC contributors because I would have had no independent basis for knowing whether they were or were not. Um, but I don't recall in detail what her words were to me I, other than what's written in this email, which may or may not have reflected her exact words. Okay. And if I can show you a larger version of the same exhibit uh, at the uh, bottom paragraph. Okay. It says, for your information, these people are major DNC com contributors, and it goes on. Uh, which basically indicates that the president would like to give the photographs out if possible. Uh, from whom did you get the information that these individuals, the, Chi the people in the, uh, that you listed, the Chinese delegation, were major uh, DNC con uh, contributors? Again, I can only presume that that information was conveyed to me by Kelly Crawford, uh, because again, I would have had no independent basis for knowing whether these people were contributors or not. Um, again, I'm not sure those were the exact words she used, but. That was the impression that I got from her. Okay. Um, you sent this email, I believe, uh, to Mr. Sutinger, among others? Yes, I did. I sent it to the entire Asia office because it was something that required a prompt response, and I wanted to make sure that if Bob wasn't around, that someone in the office. And I believe it. you sent it on April 7th at approximately 10, 12 in the morning. Is that right? That's what this email would indicate, yes. Uh, did Mr. Sutinger respond to you? Yes, he did. And how soon after you sent your email did he respond to you? This email indicates that he responded at 1124, which would have been, I guess, about an hour and a half later. And you're referring to exhibit number 198 that shows Mr. Sutinger's response to you. Is that correct? 197. Okay, 197 and 198 Both, are the yes. same. Yes. Now, I'll get into with Mr. Sutinger exactly what he responded, uh, but based upon what Mr. Sutinger responded to you, what did you do? I 
got back in touch with Kelly Crawford and I conveyed to her um, the nature of Bob's response. I believe I quoted pieces of the response back to her. She's not, the White House and the NSC are on separate email systems because our system is classified. So there was no way for me to directly send a copy of this onto her electronically. Um, but I believe I conveyed the substance of it to her and gave her an opportunity to uh, pick up a copy of the text of the email if she wanted it. And I don't recall whether she, she picked it up from me or not. Okay, in front of you is the, uh, a larger version, uh, Exhibit C-79. Uh, of Mr. Sutinger's uh, response, and it indicates that uh, he, referring to Johnny Chung, is a hustler. That's Mr. Sutinger's quotation, I believe, that has now become rather famous. Did you relay that information on to Kelly Crawford? I believe I did, so that would have been uh, a major piece of information that she would have needed. So I believe I, I don't have a specific recollection of, of uh, passing that on, but I'm quite sure that I would have. Did you make a recommendation to Ms. Crawford as to whether or not these photographs should be released? I believe I gave her a, a personal recommendation that uh, we probably would not uh, recommend that they release them. Okay, now in Mr. Sutinger's uh, email, he was uh, generally indicated that he didn't think there would be a major problem, but you took it upon yourself to recommend that the photographs not be released? It, it was not a strong recommendation on my part. Ultimately, there was nothing in Bob's email that conveyed to me that Johnny Chung or any of the individuals involved represented a national security risk or that they, they were criminals of any kind. Um, but given that it, my impression from this email was that he would perhaps attempt to exploit uh, his contacts with the president through these photos, that it might be better to err on the side of caution and not give them to him. But it did pose a serious security risk, and that's what she came to, to us to give a recommendation on. Prior to your making that recommendation, did you contact or talk with your supervisor, uh, Ms. Soudenberg? Not that I can recall. So it was basically your personal recommendation that you passed on that the photographs not be released? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sutinger, let me uh, just address a few questions to you. Um, can you briefly tell me what your background is and where you're presently employed? Um, you want my educational background? Yes, please. I graduated from Lawrence University in Wisconsin in 1968. Uh, after a stint in the uh, military, I attended uh, graduate school at Columbia University where I received a master's degree. In 1975, I joined the Central Intelligence Agency as an <laughs> analyst, principally on uh, Chinese matters, uh, and had several different uh, uh, jobs in the, uh, within the agency uh, and at the State Department. In 1994, Mr. Stanley Roth uh, asked if I would uh, assist him at the National Security Council, uh, which I did beginning in 1994 and continuing until uh, late September of uh, 1997. I'm currently employed at the uh, National Intelligence Council, which is located in Langley. Okay, so for the period of roughly 94 through 97, you were at the NSC. That's correct. The White House. Um, and can you tell me when the first time was that you heard of Johnny Chung? I can't give you a specific date uh, because my first uh, contact with Mr. Chung, I believe, was via a telephone call that he uh, made to the National Security Council uh, requesting a meeting with Mr. Roth. Uh, again, I cannot remember either the uh, specific context uh, of that telephone call or whether it was repeated, uh, but I know that his name uh, was familiar to me when it came up later on. Have you ever met Mr. Chung? I have not. And approximately how many times have you spoken to Mr. Chung then? I would guess at most two, uh, perhaps three. He was somewhat persistent, uh, as I recollect, in trying to get a meeting with Mr. Roth, um, he and a couple of other people, uh, and, and I fended off those requests. Okay. Uh, let me refer your attention to exhibit number 250, which is in your book, and it's an email dated February 2nd, 1995, from Calvin Mitchell. Did you get a copy of that email? Yes, I do. Uh, in that particular email, it indicates that um, there would be the chairman of the Chamber of International Commerce might be coming to see the president. Uh, did you know who, uh, first of all, had you ever heard of that organization, the, cha the uh, Chamber of International Commerce? I have not. Did you know the individual who was listed in that particular email? His name is vaguely familiar to me. And that was through your employment 
That's correct. Uh, at that time, which is um, February 2nd, 1995, did you uh, undertake any type of investigation or vetting of this particular individual who's listed on this email? I did not. And, and I, I won't pronounce the name. Um, I'll Mr. leave Jung. that to you. Mr. Pardon? Jung. And why was it that um, you did not do any investigation or vetting of Mr. Chung at that time? Uh, first of all, uh, it, uh, it, uh, at that time, this was just a heads up uh, rather than a request uh, that this individual be vetted. Uh, I didn't, and, and quite frankly, I had not even remembered the existence of this email until it was brought to my attention earlier this week. Uh, as an FYI, I just basically disregarded it. Are there uh, resources at the NSC which would permit the NSC to actually vet individuals? Uh, there are some at the NSC and some available via other, uh, via other means, phone calls and so forth. Okay. And without getting into any classified information, uh, those resources were, were readily available to you at the NSC? That's correct. Okay. Uh, when did you first become aware that Mr. Chung intended to bring a Chinese delegation into the White House? Uh, I, I was not aware of that until Ms. Darby wrote me the email. So the first time you heard about that at all is when Ms. Darby sent you that email? That's correct. And again, um, just for the record, let me show you uh, exhibit number 196. And that's the email that you received from Ms. Darby? Yes, it is. Uh, to your knowledge, had anyone at the NSC or the White House or anybody else vetted these individuals prior to their coming into the White House? I'm not aware of that having been done. And um, as you know, uh, maybe you don't, uh, the Secret Service uh, does a criminal background check before individuals come into the White House? Is that right? I don't know whether they do them for uh, people from uh, foreign countries. Certainly I know they do that for uh, domestic visitors. Okay. And to your knowledge, that's the extent of the background that the Secret Service does on individuals coming into the White House. I really am not uh, qualified to comment on that, sir. Thank you. <coughs> and as I understand it, um, well, one, is one of the purposes of vetting a person, to use that uh, Washington term, actually to uh, protect the president and the, the president's reputation? Uh, my understanding of the process is that it is to, uh, to make sure that people who have uh, criminal records or who are intelligence personnel who are otherwise considered, for whatever reason, unsavory, unsavory characters uh, are not put in the proximity of the president. Okay, let me refer you to your email, which is Exhibit 198. Is that your response to Ms. Darby's email? Yes, it is. Uh, in your response, you indicate that all the Chinese on the list, with one possible exception, appear to be bona fide present or former Chinese officials. How did you come to that conclusion? Uh, I came to that conclusion, uh, one, by recognizing some of the names in the list, uh, or by uh, looking up in uh, a directory, an unclassified directory of Chinese officials uh, that I had available to me, uh, or three, by uh, determining that the organizations uh, that they worked for were organizations that I recognized and heard the names of before and seemed to be bona fide uh, organizations uh, in China. And I believe there was one exception in your e email, is that right? That's correct. And who was that? That was Mr. James Sun, who was described as a self-made millionaire from Xinjiang province. Uh, I had no record of him nor any way of checking on him. Uh, was that the reason why you had some suspicions or some concerns about Mr. Sun? Well, the other reason was that there are relatively few self-made millionaires in the People's Republic of China. Uh, so that term would be, was somewhat jarring uh, and, and kind of grabbed my attention. Let me show you a portion of the video tape. Years to get here. Uh, 28 hours to get here. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 o
Okay, the, the last individual on that tape, uh, I hope that you heard, Mr. Chung introduced him as being his brother. Had you ever heard that uh, Mr. Sun was Mr. Chung's brother? No, I had not. Do you have any information one way or the other as to whether in fact Mr. Uh, Chung and Mr. Sun are brothers? Uh, I had no information to that, uh, to that effect. Uh, Chinese often refer to uh, close friends as brothers. Had you ever seen this videotape prior to coming in today? I had not. One of the uh, individuals in the Chinese delegation uh, was described as the vice president of CITIC. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and who was that individual? Uh, that is Mr. Huang Jichun, or Jichun Huang as it's written here. Is CITIC a, uh, an entity that is at least uh, partially controlled by the State Council and the PRC? I believe that's correct. And do you know approximately uh, what percentage is owned supposedly by the State Council of the PRC? I do not. And what is the State Council of the PRC? The State Council is the official governing uh, organ of the People's Republic of China. Uh, it is headed by the, the uh, Premier and, has, uh, and is in charge of all the government ministries. Uh, and many other organizations within the People's Republic. Now, if I can, let me jump ahead to uh, the, another incident that occurred in 1996 involving Wan Jun. You remember that incident? I do. Uh, okay. Um, Mr. Wan Jun, who was the purported arms dealer, uh, was also uh, involved with CITIC, is that right? Uh, I believe he is the chairman of CITIC. Back in 1995, after uh, you got the list of names from um, Ms. Darby. Did the fact that the vice president of CITIC was seeing the president, did that cause you any concern? It did not. Let me go back to your email, exhibit number 198. In your email, you indicate, but a word of caution, a warning of future deja vu, and you indicate that Mr. Chung should be treated with a, quote, pinch of suspicion, unquote. What did you mean by that? Uh, as I spelled out subsequently in the email, I was concerned that, that Mr. Chung might have been uh, making use of his political connections to further his own business interests, uh, and I was concerned that those business interests were not known to many people and that they might not be of the sort that the president would want to, be, want to be associated. Did you ever find out or learn of the various entities that Mr. Chung was involved in? I did not. And I believe uh, in that same paragraph, you also uh, used that infamous term, hustler, is that right? That's correct, sir. And it, was that for the same reason? Ba basically, yes. Now, I just ask you about whether you were aware of um, some of the entities that Mr. Chung was involved with. Um, were you aware that just prior to Mr. Chung giving a, the DNC a $50,000 contribution he had received through the uh, Bank of China, Beijing, uh, $150,000? I was not aware of that. Okay, let me, if I can, just show you quickly exhibit number 175. Exhibit number 175 is a wire transfer from the Bank of Beijing, and um, it at the bottom indicates um, payment of goods, Hauman Group, Tang Shan. You see that? I only see that. Yes, I see that. Is it Tang Shan? Tang Shan, I'm sorry. It's S H A N. I don't have that on my screen. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with the, what the Hauman Group is? No, I'm not. Okay. Are you familiar with the fact that in December of 1994, Mr. Chung had uh, brought to the White House, I believe it was the president of, Hauman, of the Hauman Group? Uh, I, was, I was not aware of that at the time. I'm aware of it now. I did not associate the, the, t the term Hauman with, uh, with those individuals. Uh, do you presently, or did at the time in uh, April when you wrote your memo, uh, did you know whether Mr. Uh, Chung had actually, and I hate to use the term, uh, sold the Hauman Group any goods? I was not aware of it. 
let me ask you a couple more questions about if I can go back to exhibit number 198. Your email continues by uh, stating the joys of balancing foreign policy considerations against domestic politics. Uh, did you often have to do that at the uh, NSA and National Security Council? No. Uh, what did you mean by that term? Uh, the situation was that that these individuals uh, had come in without my being aware of it. Uh, we were being asked as a matter of domestic policy uh, and in, in particular uh, DNC policy uh, to make a judgment call as to whether or not photographs should be given. Uh, that was not uh, a, uh, a task that I relished. Why not? Uh, I, I simply considered it to be, to be outside the scope of my, my own responsibilities. How much weight did the DNC carry when it came to deciding who would meet with the president? I, I can't answer that question. After your warning of April 8th, do you know how often Mr. Chung would, would then go into the White House? I did not know that at the time. Uh, I obviously learned it subsequently from newspaper accounts. So you're aware that it would be approximately 20 additional times he entered the White House even after your November 8th, 1995 warning? I'd have to take your word for that. Uh, were you also aware that in July of 1995, or did you become aware in July of 1995 that Mr. Chung was attempting to negotiate the release of Harry Wu? I did become aware of that. And how did you become aware of that? Uh, I received a, uh, in, in fact, in two separate copies, some correspondence from, uh, from the Chief of Staff's office, I believe. I'd have to refer to the documents in particular, indicating that Mr. Chung had sought some credentials uh, from the DNC to undertake this kind of mission. Let me show you exhibit number 251. It's a memorandum from uh, Janice Enright at the Office of the Chief of Staff of the President to Anthony Lake. Did you ever see that document before? Yes, I have. And when did you see it? Um, it would have been uh, around the time, probably very shortly before my response, somewhere between the 21st uh, and the 24th of July. And you made a response to this memo then, is that right? This memo was, was sent on to me uh, uh, through the system, as we call it, in the uh, National Security Council. And I responded to it finally, I'm sorry, I had my date wrong, July 31st. Okay, let me show you exhibit number 252. Can you tell me what that is? That is a memo that I wrote to Mr. Lake in response to, uh, uh, to the uh, memorandum from Ms. Enright that was sent on to me. What was your reaction about Mr. Chung attempting to negotiate the release of Harry Wu? I was quite upset. Why? We had been engaged in uh, a very quiet, uh, persistent, and complex uh, set of signals and negotiations with the Chinese government trying to ensure that Mr. Wu was released uh, as soon as possible. And it struck me that, that, uh, that Mr. Chung might uh, be capable of interfering in that process. I had no idea of what message he thought he was delivering to the Chinese government and thought it could only confuse the matter. Uh, and I was worried that, that, uh, that, th that this process might be upset by the intrusion of somebody who had no knowledge uh, and no responsibilities for what happened. Were you concerned that Mr. Chung was not a professional diplomat? It wasn't so much that he was a professional diplomat as, as that he seemed to believe that he had some sort of a mission. Uh, and it was a mission that, that, uh, that I didn't believe that he had uh, and that I was concerned would complicate what we were trying to do in our own appropriate channels. Now, your memorandum is actually written, I believe, at the very bottom. It says uh, Mr. Chung had already left for Beijing uh, at the time you had written your memorandum, is that right? That's correct. If that's the case, why did you feel the need to write that memorandum? One, it was sent to me for action. And generally speaking, when we were given uh, an assignment for action, we tried to uh, respond, answer the mail, if you will. Uh, and I also thought that, uh, that I wanted to convey, convey to Mr. Lake my concerns uh, about this sort of thing, uh, because I certainly didn't want a repetition of it. At the bottom, uh, you indicate that you had the concurrence of Alan uh, Kretzko, is that right? 
That's correct. Who is Mr. Kretzko? Mr. Kretzko was the uh, uh, senior director, uh, legal assistant to the National Security Council. And why did you feel that you had to have the concurrence of Mr. Kretzko? Uh, it involved an American citizen, two American citizens. Did you ever find out who Mr. Chung met while he was in Beijing or what he did? Uh, I only read one newspaper account, and I don't know whether it was credible or not. Mr. Chairman, I have no other questions. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, use some of your time uh, on the Republican side, uh, if I might. I want to make sure I, I understand this. This Mr. Zing Hongye, Zheng Hongye. Yeah. Uh, he was chairman of the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, the CCPIT, an organization set up by the Chinese Communist Party to coordinate lucrative deals and funnel profits back into the party's leadership. Uh, you were aware of who he was. Your definition of, of that organization, sir, is not one that I had heard before. Um, m my understanding of the CCPIT is that it was uh, an organization that was set up to promote uh, international trade. It sponsored business delegations coming to the PRC uh, and also Chinese delegations going overseas. It was a part of the communist uh, government. Uh, that's correct. I think that says it. Uh, he was an advisor to the PRC state-owned China Ocean Shipping Company, Costco, uh, which wanted to lease the Long Beach Naval sh uh, Shipyard. I was not aware of that, sir. Uh, he was vice chairman of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference of the PRC's Communist Party for the Subcommittee for Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Compatriots, and Overseas Chinese. Were you aware of that? No, I was not. You were not aware of that either? Uh, Mr. Jai Chun Huang, he was director and vice president of China International Trust and Investment Corporation, CIDIC, you knew that? Yes, sir. And uh, CIDIC is the largest state-run business in the PRC uh, with diversified holdings in banking, energy production, and the U.S. real estate market. And the president is the alleged arms smuggler, as was mentioned before, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wang Zhen. Wang Zhen, you're familiar with that? I'm familiar with the fact that Mr. Wong is, is the uh, chairman of CIDIC. And uh, Mr. Renzhong Wang served as superintendent of the China Aviation Industry Ministry, part of the Chinese Communist government in Harbin. You're familiar with that? Um, Wang Renzhong is, is a rather common name, and there are a number of them who have been uh, in different offices. I, I will take well, your that's, word for Well, that's what our information shows. I, I'd take your word for him. And, of course, uh, Zhe, Zhenglong Yu I uh, was uh, oversees the activities of the Costco Shipping Company, Chinese Shipping Company. Uh, the reason I, I, I bring all this up is these people have been alleged to have been part of a beer operation over there, but they had far-reaching responsibilities in China and ties to the Communist Party. They're coming in to meet the president. They meet with the president. He greets them warmly. And then after pictures are taken, he doesn't want the pictures to be given to them. Uh, and and you, you didn't. Uh, think that the picture should be given to them, I guess, as well. Uh, my email suggests that I didn't think there would be any lasting damage from providing the photographs to these individuals. Uh -huh. uh, I have no further questions. Mr. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing is a continuation of a hearing we held yesterday, and both days are looking at uh, a man by the name of Johnny Chung who seemed to have uh, an extraordinary amount of access to the White House and gave large amounts of money to the Democratic Party. Um, Mr. Sutinger and Ms. Darby, you're here. Oftentimes, witnesses are invited to come and testify because we think maybe it did something wrong. But you're here to give us your professional judgment from the uh, National Security Council about uh, some matters that took place with Mr. Chung. And Mr. Uh, Sutinger, you said in a memo that I think Council's already referred to that when you gave your impression of Mr. Chung, you said, my impression is that he's a hustler and appears to be involved in setting up some kind of consulting operation. Well, I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, nothing we have learned or in the materials that the committees received indicates anything else. Uh, I don't believe this is a hearing about economic espionage or foreign agents or conspiracies to infiltrate our political system or any of these more sensational charges that have been bandied about. What it appears to me is that we have a man who was out to try to make a buck. 
Abe was a hustler. And the fact of the matter is there are a lot of hustlers around, especially in this city. There's nothing illegal in being a hustler, even if we might not approve of it. Now, the two of you are here to testify on one very narrow issue in particular. And that was the fact that Mr. Chung took a bunch of people in to listen to the president give a radio address to the country. And from the testimony yesterday, after that radio address, the president, after meeting these people, said that he felt so something was inappropriate. And Ms. Enright some told somebody, I guess to Ms. Darby, to find out whether they ought to release the photos to this man. And um, Mr. Sutinger, you were asked your opinion about that. And I gather you agreed that the photos could go to uh, uh, Mr. Chung and his uh, colleagues. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, Mr. Sutinger, you're, you're here because you're one of the leading experts on China. You uh, have made this your career. You speak Mandarin. You speak uh, Cantonese. Uh, you are, I think, fair to say that you, you served as one of the NSC's top experts on East Asia. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Uh, it's not for me to say, sir. That, don't, don't be immodest. Um, in April 1995, you were asked by Brooke Darby to give your professional opinion as to whether the White House should release these photos to Johnny Chung. And you concluded in April 1995, quote, I don't see any lasting damage to the U.S. foreign policy from giving Johnny Chung these pictures. Is that, is that right? That's correct. Okay. In the second paragraph of your April 7, 1995 email, you did state some reservations about Mr. Chung. <laughs> and um, you were concerned he was trying to use his White House contacts to enhance his business. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. But your reservations had nothing to do with Mr. Chung trying to influence U.S. US foreign policy. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Was your email intended to be a general directive to all White House staff to avoid contacts with Johnny Chung? I'm not sure I'd go that far, sir. I just wanted uh, to, to raise some concerns that had been brought to my attention that I thought others should know uh, about what Mr. Chung might be up to. It was a simple response to a request for advice about the release of these photos. That's correct. Now, was uh, Brooke Darby's request for advice about the release of photo photos a matter of high importance to you as a member of the National Security Council? No, it was not. Is, is um, every day the NSC has to deal with the most sensitive and pressing national security matters facing this country. Isn't that a fair statement? I believe that's fair, sir. And so the release of photos is one of the least important questions you had to grapple with. It, it was not one that I thought was of burning national interest. Okay. Um, Based on your expertise, were the businessmen who accompanied Johnny Chung senior members of the Chinese government? Uh, they were senior members. Uh, yes, they were either senior members or former senior members. It's hard to draw uh, a sharp distinction uh, between what are essentially government-owned corporations and the government itself. They have no governing authority, uh, but they certainly have plenty of, of state backing. Can you give us your uh, views as to the relative importance of these businessmen with China? Relative importance in terms of what, sir? Uh, how important figures were they? Were they, uh, we just had the president of China, he's obviously the most important. Are these Way below that. Pardon? Far below that. Far below that. Now, in July 1995, you drafted a memo concerning a request for presidential credentials letters for Johnny Chung. He was interested in a letter from the president because he wanted to go to China uh, to free, see if he can free jail dissident Harry Wu. Isn't that right? That's correct. Okay. And in your July 31, 1995 memo to Anthony Lake, you referred to Mr. Chung and said, no one in the administration has any idea of what he plans to say on the subject to Harry Wu, and I doubt the president did more than shake his hand in a receiving line. Did that statement correctly reflect your views in 19, July 1995? That is correct. In other words, you had no reason to believe that the president ever encouraged Mr. Chung to go to China. In fact, you had no reason to believe that the president was aware of anything about Mr. Chung. Uh, I, I, was, I had no reason to believe that at the time, no. Subsequent to July 1995, have you learned of anything that causes you to believe that the president encouraged Mr. Chung to go to China? As I said, the only information that I have uh, received about Mr. Chung's uh, travel to China has been what has been published in the newspapers and I have no way of assessing its credibility. 
You know, Mr. Chung had a letter from DNC Chairman Don Fowler. Was this letter the kind of credentials letter that is provided to diplomats? No. In fact, the traditional diplomatic credential letters are provided by governments rather than political parties, aren't That's they? That's correct. Okay. Um, and you yourself wrote to Mr. Lake and said that Chung's credentials, meaning Chairman Fowler's letter, are thin. What did you mean by that? I thought that, that they would not be interpreted by the Chinese government as representing uh, the, uh, the views of the President or the government of the United States. Some Republicans have suggested that Johnny Chung, who as an American citizen, should somehow have been restrained by the administration from traveling to China on his own to pursue his own private efforts concerning Harry Wu. In your experience, has it sometimes happened that American citizens undertake their own private diplomatic efforts? I would say there are probably examples of that, yes, sir. Well, I, you call them freelancers. Yes. There are a lot of freelancers around who promote their view of what diplomacy ought to be, aren't there? Yes, there are. In fact, uh, in your interview, uh, you call these kinds of individuals freelancers because you're generally skeptical about these efforts of these freelancers. They're not operating consistent with what U.S. government policy might That's be. That's correct. Uh, now, freelancers are not something unique uh, uh, to this one case. Uh, you've encountered freelancers from the American business community. In fact, wasn't Ross Perot once organized, who organized a rescue mission to free some of the, his employees from captivity in the Middle East? Wasn't that an example of a freelancer? He was acting on his I, own. I, I, I would not want to characterize that, sir. Okay. Uh, when people in the academic community go off on their own, are they freelancers as well? I, I think we need to um, draw a distinction between going out on, uh, I mean, everybody who travels to China is not a freelancer. Um, well, you have what amnesty. I'm concerned about is when they're, when they're dealing with or trying to deal with uh, an issue of particular uh, national importance, such as the release of Mr. Wu. Uh, in, in those cases, I, I consider interference or efforts uh, to, to be influential in that process to be freelancing. It's the same as Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or a member of Congress acting on his own but not in sync with the American government going and doing what might be called freelancing. The difference between Mr. Chung's case and those is that Mr. Chung was going out representing himself uh, as, as being on a mission that was connected to the White House, at least via the DNC, and I thought that was of considerable concern. Yeah. Well, I can see that point, and I think it's a valid one. I want to yield to Mr. Lantos to pursue further questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for yielding. Well, today's uh, episode of Trivial Pursuit uh, deals with uh, pathological preoccupation with photo opportunities. Now, uh, I find these particular photo opportunities uh, paling into insignificance when compared to the photo opportunities that the President of China just had during the course of his visit to the United States. As a matter of fact, prior to his visit I publicly pointed out that having himself photographed at Williamsburg or at the Liberty Bell or at the White House or at Wall Street will do nothing to diminish our outrage at human rights violations in China. And of course, in terms of who has himself photographed with the top man in China, certainly there was a state dinner at the White House where everybody tried to get himself photographed with him. He visited here in the Congress where uh, the Speaker took him around. He had breakfast with uh, uh, several of us. Uh, and of course, when, when he went to New York, the cream of the crop of the American business and financial community busted its gut to get into that dinner and to get themselves photographed with the top man in China. So quite frankly, I sort of failed to get excited over the fact that a, a group of uh, third-rate Chinese officials stood by while the president was reading a prepared uh, five-minute radio talk. I do want to spend a minute on the Harry Wu case, because while I find the rest of this ludicrous, ludicrous beyond words, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't rise to the level of anything worthy of any serious discussion. 
Uh, Mr. Chung is a, is a cheap and unfortunately for him by this page, an unsuccessful hustler. And he was collecting photographs all over the, 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 the political landscape from, president, from a presidential candidate Dole to uh, distinguished Republican governors, Speaker Gingrich, the First Lady and whatnot, and put them together in a brochure, and that is what he was selling. He was selling the illusion. If I were to characterize him, I would call him an illusion merchant. He was selling an illusion that since Senator Dole happened to have his picture taken with him, somehow he had influence with Senator Dole or Newt Gingrich or the First Lady, which was about as absurd a suggestion as anything that could be made. But the Harry Wu thing annoys me, and I tell you why it annoys me. Harry Wu is one of the heroes of our age. He has uh, given many, many years of his life because of his commitment to democracy and freedom in his attempt to demonstrate the, st the slave labor system in China. He spent many years of his life in the most miserable Chinese prison conditions. And the very best people in this Congress on both sides of the aisle, in both the House and the Senate, and many people in the private sector, have busted their guts for years to get Harry Wu out. And the notion that Johnny Chung, this quintessentially cheap self-promoter, played the slightest role in the liberation of Harry Wu is a notion that I find repugnant and obnoxious. Uh, this is the notion of the rooster who claims that the sun rises because he crows. Uh, it, it, this does not even rise to the level of absurdity. It is beyond absurdity. But since we need to go on with, uh, with uh, today's episode of uh, Trivial Pursuit, I would like to place into the record, um, Mr. Chairman, the article of October 30 from the Washington Post entitled Business Mixes with Pleasure at the White House Dinner, China's Junk Gets a Taste of Corporate America, which describes in detail how the leaders of our major multinational corporations were anxious to have their pictures taken with, uh, uh, with the president of China, who I think is a more significant figure uh, than the, the small entourage that got into the radio studio. I Th thank the gentleman for without yielding. Objection. Yield to uh, Ms. Baloney, who's next to the seniority on the Democratic okay. side. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, for, for yielding to me. I, I would uh, like to ask Mr. Suttinger, earlier we were talking about uh, the gentlemen that were Mr. Chung, with Mr. Chung, and many of them were associated, you said, with uh, the Chinese government, but it is a communist country, and uh, the communist country owns all, if not, or most of the businesses there, and are most of the people in business in China associated with the um, Chinese government? Is that a fair statement, would you say? I don't think so. So there are, there are a lot of private businesses. There, there is a growing amount of private enterprise in China. That's correct. I would um, like to ask both of you um, the same question, first Ms. Darby and then Mr. Sudinger. Uh, do you have any reason to believe that Johnny Chung was an agent of the Chinese government, Ms. Darby? No, I do not. Mr. Sudinger? I do not. Do you believe that he tried to seek any favors for China, Ms. Darby? I really have no basis for knowing. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Not having been present at any of Mr. Chung's meetings, I can't answer the question. Do you believe that it was unusual for Johnny Chung to seek to have his picture taken with the president, uh, the first lady, or other members of the administration? And do you believe that Johnny Chung was unique in, in seeking to obtain those photographs? From what I understand in press accounts recently, it doesn't sound like this was an unusual situation. Again, I have no basis on which to make a judgment on that. Do you think it is unusual for a businessman to display a photograph of himself with the president uh, 
the First Lady or members of Congress or leaders in the administration? No, I do not think it's unusual. I would think not. Is there anything uh, illegal or unethical in, in seeking to obtain such a picture or to display it? I don't believe so. Not to my knowledge. Do you believe that the White House typically asked for guidance with respect to people granted <laughs> access to the president? They sought access on some, they sought our, our um, opinion on some occasions whenever they had a concern. I, I would have to defer to Ms. Darby on that. Do you think that it was common for people to gain access to the president without being screened by the National Security Council? That I really wouldn't know. I'm sure there are many people who are not screened by the National Security Council, but in terms of foreign nationals or others, I really wouldn't know. Nor do I. And uh, what do you think the White House uh, should do to make the vetting process more effective? Do you have any ideas in that direction? I understand that Sandy Berger, the current National Security Advisor, has instituted some new vetting policies. I'm not sure what those are. Uh, I believe it's to make more routine um, inquiries into people who are coming in to see the president who have a foreign connection of some kind. Could you forward those recommendations to the committee so we could look at them instead <laughs> or get them for us? Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe they're recommendations that have already been made by Sandy Berger, so. So they've already been made, but I'd, I'd just like to see them, that's all. I guess we can get them from him. Yeah, I don't work for the National Security mm -hmm. Council any longer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nor do I. Do you have any ideas of how they should improve their vetting process? Or, or do you think it needs to be improved? I'm talking to Mr. Sutinger. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I would have no recommendations on that score. You have no recommendations. I'd like to... Um, Ask Ms. Darby, when, uh, when you worked at the National Security Council, could you describe your duties and, and, and exactly what you did there? Sure. I, um, I handled Nancy Soderbergh's schedule uh, at least part of the time, would make sure that she had briefing papers for her meetings. I generally did not prepare those. Those were prepared by the professional staff members with the policy expertise. Uh, I was not a policy advisor of any kind. I would prioritize paperwork for her. I would... Um, help screen requests from the staff who wanted her advice on something and prioritize things for her. Uh, I was also occasionally a liaison between other parts of the White House with Nancy Soderbergh and members of the National Security Council staff based on primarily on the connections that I'd made during my days on the campaign and on the transition. Did you serve as a contact person for White House staff who needed to direct requests for guidance to the National Security Council? Sometimes it was not an official uh, responsibility that I would say I had, but more informally, I think that I often became a conduit for those kinds of requests. And when you received those requests, how did you handle them? I would staff them out to the relevant policy office in the National Security Council. There are both regional offices that handle, obviously, regions, and functional offices that handle things like defense issues, nonproliferation issues. And on the basis of the request that I received, I would make a determination about which office needed to uh, handle that request, and I would farm the request out to that relevant office. How often did the President's office ask for guidance from the National Security Council with respect to a visitor or a letter? Yeah, I really don't recall any specific... Uh, I re it's hard to put a number on it. If I had to guess, I would say maybe four to eight times a month. Did you, did you usually receive a request for guidance before the event? Yes, we generally did. Uh, I mean, that was the purpose of us providing guidance. Providing guidance after the fact isn't exceedingly helpful, so. Um, and and uh, under what circumstances would a, a request for guidance typically be made? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, a uh, foreign, uh, someone with a foreign tie who wanted to come in and see the president and it came through another office in the White House and they just wanted to check with us to make sure that there was nothing about the person's background that would lead us to have any concerns about the president meeting with somebody or, or other senior people within the White House. If Mr. Stutinger saw no lasting damage to United States foreign policy from giving uh, Johnny Chung the photos, why did you consider that a negative recommendation? Uh, I think his, his using the term hustler, the fact that this person was probably going to exploit the photographs for his own personal business interests. Again, it was really my own personal uh, recommendation to Kelly Crawford that if I were in her situation, I wouldn't want this person continually harassing me for photographs uh, of himself with the president. So better to err on the side of caution for my own personal benefit.
if I were Kelly Crawford. In, in your own experience, was a, was a request for guidance about the release of a uh, presidential photograph one of the most important uh, matters confronting the National Sur Security Council in April of uh, 1995? No, it certainly was not, and I, I didn't uh, sort of independently recall this incident at all until I saw the, the text of my email published in the New York Times. Well, getting back to your, your email, uh, you wrote in your email message that these people, referring to Johnny Chung and his group, were major DNC contributors. Is that correct? That's what I wrote, yes. Um, how did you know that? Um, did you have actual knowledge that this fact was correct? No, I did not. I have no idea who contributes to the DNC, or, and I believe the only way I would have known this was if uh, Kelly Crawford conveyed it to me, if not in those specific terms, in more general terms that I took to mean that they were DNC contributors. Because, uh, so in other words, she conveyed that information. I presume so. I don't have an independent recollection, but the fact that it's in the email and I would have no other way of knowing whether they were contributors or not. Ms. Belloni, I wanted to uh, yield to uh, Mr. Fatah uh -huh. on the time that we have a lot of them okay, we'll five minute round. But I, I, in doing so, I just want to make the comments so no one misunderstands. There are a lot of people who use photos for their own promotional activities. Lobbyists do it all the time. The reason people go to political fundraisers is often just so they can get a picture with the president, Senator Dole, Newt Gingrich, and then they hustle it to see what, how far they can go with it to, to promote themselves. Mr. Fatah? Thank you very much. Uh, let me welcome you both here today. And um, it's interesting as times change. I guess, Ms. Darby, you unfortunately uh, are, have been consorting with known Democratic sympathizers. Um, the Congress at another point in its history was interested in those who were sympathetic to the causes of another political party. And I want to focus in on this, the communist government of China, because it is of interest to me, given the context of our relationship since President Nixon opened up our relationships with this country, uh, there have been a succession of presidents who have moved, continued to move in that direction. Uh, and of interest is this, uh, this discussion about the supposed arms dealer, Wan Jung, Wang Jun. of the SciTech. Cedic? Cedic. Yeah, I want to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman, a number of newspaper articles which I'm going to refer to, one from the Chicago uh, Tribune, another from the Portland, Oregon, Oregonian. Uh, and they outline, first of all, that George Bush had dinner with this gentleman, uh, who we now want to raise a lot of concerns about him having a picture taken with President Clinton. In fact, he says that, that um, Henry Kissinger is a good friend of his. Uh, there are a number of important political figures in our country who are on the advisory council for this corporation, uh, like former Secretary of State George Shultz uh, and former Secretary of State Alexander Haig. Um, there are a number of other people who have close ties to the Republican Party, um, like a gentleman by the name of Mr. Greenberg, who's the head of AIG, who's a well-known and very substantial contributor to the Republican Party, who's also uh, on the board. And I want to enter these into the record because first and foremost, there was never a meeting. Let me ask for permission that they be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. First and foremost, contrary to all of these statements that the president had a meeting with these people, there is nothing anywhere in the record to suggest that there was a meeting. They were in the audience when there was a radio address, they got a picture taken, and they left. The president then said to his closest aide that he has some concerns about the appropriateness of their visit, which therefore got the two of you involved in an after-the-fact request as to whether or not the picture should be released. But I do want to note, since there such, seems to be such an interest in our interrelationships between the People's Republic and particularly these group of business people, that if the committee is interested, maybe there's some other people who we could call in and ask, because they seem to have a lot of knowledge about how this corporation functions, and particularly this gentleman. Um, and these are not, this is not something we, duck, we, we dug up anywhere. These are articles that appeared and are available. I know the committee's got a large staff, 
So I'm sure that the majority has knowledge of these contacts, even as it attempts to infer some inappropriate behavior on behalf of the president, when everything that suggests is to the contrary, as based on this record, that this gentleman uh, did nothing more than get his picture taken. But he is someone who's had extensive contacts and business relationships with major leaders in the majority's party. So I think that we would want to have a chance. He also had a, at this dinner, uh, the former national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, was also present as reported in this Chicago Tribune article that was dated March 23rd, 1997. And the other article from the Portland newspaper is dated uh, March the 16th. But I want to ask you, because you are, to the best of my knowledge, the first person that's appeared before us who really has any knowledge about China, uh, to answer some questions about this nation's relationship. Even though we continue to talk about the government as if it's a government in which we have no um, ongoing relationship with, isn't it true that for the last few decades we've had the uh, the policy, the foreign policy of our nation has been to reach out and to uh, be involved in a constructive engagement with the People's Republic of China? That is correct. And isn't it true that we allow uh, free travel uh, between citizens of our country, particularly American businessmen, who by the thousands go to China seeking and in many cases winning business uh, over there? That also is correct. Because when the president of China came here, and he was referred to, he, he came to my district, he signed a contract with Boeing for a few billion dollars. I didn't notice anybody in the, the majority party uh, jumping up and down about this relationship with the communist government of China. I mean, they were clapping and being, uh, being pleased that there was going to be this business, uh, this business deal with the, the Boeing Corporation. So. The inference that's being drawn here is that any association, anything having to do with the People's Republic of China, having to do with the Clinton White House is somehow inappropriate. Isn't that contrary to everything that's been done uh, since President Nixon went to China and President Ford continued that relationship and President Carter, President Reagan and President Bush weren't, didn't we continue to encourage at almost every level interactions with the People's Republic of China, their government, their citizens, and their various institutions? The policy of engagement with China has been consistent over the last several administrations, sir. Can you help me then to understand, even as the Congress voted to continue most favored nation status, and it's clear that these uh, persons who were here and who got their picture taken uh, with the president, um, and it as you've indicated, you don't have any reason to believe that the person who arranged this, uh, Johnny Chung, was an agent of the, the government in any way. Um, is it the practice of the People's Republic of China, based on all of your studies and knowledge, that they would attempt to, uh, as part of their uh, activities, to interfere in the internal uh, political workings of the United States? I don't really think I am in any way able to answer that question in a uh, in the way that you would like it to be answered. Uh, I you simply don't have the information. That's fine with me. But no, no, I'm trying to be truthful, sir. Yeah. It, it, it calls for a judgment uh, that that uh, involves information uh, that is classified. It calls for a judgment well, we that we, we requires we study way beyond what I can well, do. The gentleman yield. There were yes. press reports that there might have been a, uh, a, a Chinese intelligence people uh, or government officials of some sort trying to look at how to influence Congress. There was never any report that I saw in the press that said they were trying to uh, do something to influence the presidential election. That, 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 that is correct. But we won't press uh, in, towards, in, in relationship to any classified information. Let's just deal with what, you know, what's obvious. Um, the, Johnny Chung has been accused of essentially trying to use his relationship with important, powerful political figures to make money. Do you think that there may be a few other thousand people uh, who come into this city who have relationships with political figures who from time to time have been noted to try to make a, a buck? I'd, I'd have to defer to others' judgment on that, sir. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your testimony. I thank the, the ranking uh, member for uh, yielding.
Gentleman's time has expired, uh, Mr. Barr. During the uh, time period that we're talking about here, and that is during uh, 19 and 95, uh, what security clearances did each of you possess? I had a top secret SCI clearance. That, that means top secret code word? Yes. Mr. Sutinger? I have full clearances, sir. Top secret code word? Yes. And that entitles you to see uh, a, a fairly wide range of classified materials maintained by our government? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sutinger, uh, would you please enumerate for me the number of uh, countries in the world whose national security concerns uh, and whose economic, political, diplomatic, and military interests coincide 100% with those of the United States at all times? Zero. Uh, could you please enumerate for me the number of countries in the world that would have absolutely no interest whatsoever at any time in making policies of this country more favorable towards theirs? I'm not sure I understand your use of the term making them more favorable. Interpret it any way you like. What I'm trying to, my, my point is, and I, and I would presume, and tell me if, I, uh, if you don't, I'm, my point is, and I'm presuming you would agree with me, that at some point in time, every country with which we deal, or virtually every other country in the world, at some point in time, uh, has policy matters uh, and interests that may differ from ours, and for which they would like to see our policies change and become more favorable to what they would like to see and, and to coincide with their interests. Would that be fair to say? Yes, sir. I mean, it's essentially the nature of politics. Hans Morgenthau wrote about it, wrote about it two generations ago, and it, it's the nature of, of, of national sovereignty. Uh, in, in the Exhibit 198, uh, if we could have that uh, up again, please, uh, you posed the question, who am I to complain? Uh, I think you're a very appropriate person to complain, uh, to be very honest with you. Uh, you have a very substantial background in an understanding of foreign relations. Uh, you have access to very important classified information of our government that bears on the highest levels of our national security. Uh, you have people uh, such as Ms. Brooke who turn to you for guidance. And I think you have a, a very clear responsibility to the president, whoever that president is. And uh, I know from your background also that uh, your interest in national security and in providing the unvarnished uh, information and advice to the administration, the president, is not motivated by political concerns for one party or another. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, therefore, I, th I think that the answer to your question posed in that email is, who am I to complain? I think you're a very appropriate person to have complained. Uh, it isn't so much as the other side indicates that all sorts of people want to have their picture taken with the president. Uh, we all know that. Uh, and I apologize for you having to sit there and hear them endlessly go on and on about that. Uh, we also know that there are all sorts of people who try and get access to the president, and a number of those succeed. That, that's not the point here either. Uh, my concern uh, right at the moment does not really have anything to do with Mr. Johnny Chung either. Uh, it has to do with what seems to be a complete lack of process and last, lack of safeguards uh, in protecting the president. And I may disagree with this president rather strenuously in a lot of areas, but I do think as the leader of this country, uh, he needs to be protected. He needs to have people like you uh, complaining when it's appropriate. Uh, we have people who had gotten in to see the president, apparently without any background check whatsoever. Uh, apparently, from Ms. Uh, Ms. Broom's term, test, uh, Brooks' testimony earlier, uh, we may provide a slightly, uh, we may provide a higher level of protection for imp people improperly getting into the president. Uh, for our citizens and foreign citizens, which strikes me as very, very odd. Uh, my point is, you say that, who are you to concern, and then you go on to say they, they seem to be bona fide Chinese officials. 
how were you able to reach that conclusion? That's my understanding that no, no checks were made on, on, these, on these people. Well, let me uh, say two things. One, I had at my, uh, in my office a handbook, unclassified handbook of Chinese officials. And I found some, but not all, of the individuals on this list, as I explained before, uh, in that book and was able to verify that either through that resource or from my own memory of the Chinese government and its uh, organizations, that uh, the individuals or the organizations that they represented were in fact bona fide organizations, non-criminal, uh, not intelligence related so far as I could determine. Uh, and that's the basis of my judgment. Uh, if I may just say that, that my question in there, which you referred to, uh, the who am I to complain, was entirely meant in sarcasm. Well, but then you didn't, you didn't complain, uh, really. Uh, I mean, I, I, I just think that, that, that the process that, that seems to have been in place at that time really ill-served the president, uh, where people could get in to see him. Uh, and again, it's not a matter of everybody likes to get in to see the president and then may do something with those pictures. These were officials of a communist government whose national policy interests frequently don't coincide with ours, and uh, yet there seems to have been virtually no effort made. And, I, and this isn't necessarily you know, your fault, Mr. Sutinger, I'm talking about the process that seems to have been in place at that time, uh, very similar to what uh, Mr. Aldrich wrote about in, in Unlimited Access, that I think raises some very serious concerns. And, and that's the reason that we're looking into this. It's not trivial. I think it goes to the heart of national security concerns of our country. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Cummings. Uh, I, too, want to uh, thank you all for being here today. And. Uh, Mr. Sutinger, I just want to ask you, uh, you said a little bit earlier uh, something that was very interesting. You said that when you looked at these folks who took the pictures with the President, um, you said in answer to another question as to high, how high ranking they may have been uh, with regard to the government of China, you said they were far below that. That was your, those were your words, in other words, far below the president. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? The power structure. Do you recall? Pardon me? Yes, I do recall right. the answer. Uh, the power structure in China uh, is one that places the party, obviously, at the peak uh, of the government structure. Uh, also, there is a separate but related structure uh, of government, i.e. administrative uh, offices that, that, uh, that take place since uh, the beginning of what's called the reform period of China, which is about 1980, uh, there has been an effort to split off uh, and to sort of, uh, the, the, the proper term is not privatized, but at least uh, separate the operations of uh, organizations such as business organizations, or even in some cases ministries, from the direct control of the party, uh, because it was found that that was not a particularly efficient way to do business. So that uh, some of these organizations were formally established. CIDIC grew out of that kind of a, of a process to allow enough leeway for these individuals and organizations to make decisions that made sense in a business context uh, and separate them from a political context. These individuals were, I would say, the equivalent of people perhaps at the deputy assistant secretary level would be comparable here uh, or, or perhaps even in some cases below that. They were not, uh, they are not individuals uh, who have uh, significant political power or influence within the Chinese government. They are people who are responsible for uh, attracting business to China uh, and for making sure that China uh, receives investment from outside the country. I think Mr. Fatah was uh, mentioning a little bit earlier about when the president of China came here and how uh, a lot of people were elected officials, and many of them in this Congress uh, were very happy to see him because he was bringing business opportunities uh, to uh, the United States. And I think Mr. Fatah mentioned Boeing in his district. Um, and I wonder, is this something very unusual, in other words, for foreign governments to, uh, uh, to want to try to uh, uh, do business with the United States of America and its companies uh, here? I, I'm just curious. My sense is it's not unusual at all. 
Uh -huh. So you, so I take it when you went through the book that you said, you said you had a, a, some kind of document, a book in your office that, uh, that basically gave you certain information about who some of these people may have been. Uh, did you, when, uh, looking at that book, did you get the impression that uh, some of these folks were business people? Yes, in the particular context of, of China's business operation. And so it didn't strike you as odd that maybe these people uh, going through Mr. Chung, this fellow who you call the hustler, uh, were perhaps looking for some possible business opportunities. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, now was that a concern of yours, the fact that maybe they may have been looking for some business opportunities? Not particularly a concern, uh, except insofar as it was involving the president. All right. Now let me, let me ask you this. Um, you use the word hustler, and um, it's a very interesting word. Um, and I take it that you felt that this was someone who was trying to, I think, uh, uh, make himself out to be, talking about Mr. Chung now, uh, a lot more than what he was. Is that right? I, I used the term in the pool hall sense, sir. All right, I don't know what you mean by that. Would you say that? Well, some, somebody who uh, may be uh, doing something different than what he appears uh, to be doing at the outset and, and may have uh, a private agenda that, that is not immediately uh, evident. And so when you, when you uh, saw this, uh, you wanted to make sure that your opinion was stated. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, do you know whether anybody listened to your opinion or, or acted on your opinion? Um, Ms. Darby suggested that she did. Okay. Now, Ms. Darby, um, your job was basically to kind of do some screening. Is that correct? Is that part of your job? Was that? Screening in terms of paperwork, yes. Mm -hmm. And so when you uh, was dealing with this issue, uh, was there anything to cause you to feel that uh, perhaps these, these were some fellows that were just looking for some business opportunities? Uh, the impression I got from Bob's response to my email was that these were people who, or Johnny Chung in particular, might try to use the photograph to put up on his wall to show that he had access to the White House from his friends with the President, but that's something that a lot of people do. Um, and so only in that context. So you didn't, so though, that what you just said, that thought process that you just told us about, you didn't find that to be anything unusual. In other words, that people would want to try to use a picture of the president to, to make themselves look good and perhaps have certain influence uh, in certain circles uh, that they may, might not normally have. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. All right, thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Next Mr. Horn. Mr. Thank Horn. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to pursue some questions that concern Harry Wu. Uh, as I recall, Mr. Suttinger, uh, and we've gone over this memo of April 7th, uh, 1995, uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, that you had some suspicions about uh, uh, Mr. Chung. And uh, I assume that uh, you might recall that uh, Irene Wu, uh, who is uh, a staff member of Mr. Chung's firm, uh, wrote a, uh, a letter to uh, Betty Curry, who is the uh, secretary to the president, saying, please have President Clinton write me, this is right, Johnny Chung, a credential letter for my trip to China. I have enclosed a letter dated October 3rd, 1994, which I cannot use for this trip because it's for Taiwan. Thank you very much for your help. And uh, I, do you recall that uh, you were consulted at all when uh, the Wu situation of Harry Wu came up in relation to Mr. Chung? I was not. Do you recall any on that? Uh, have you, did you ever see the facts I just uh, mentioned, which is Exhibit 204? And uh, 205 is a letter that could have well come uh, with the one from uh, Irene uh, that uh, would uh, give Mr. Uh, uh, Chung a glowing uh, letter uh, when he goes to China. And if you look at 206, we have on stationery, 
Bill Clinton, October 3rd, 1994, uh, to Mr. Chung, signed Bill, please let me extend my appreciation to you for your participation in my birthday celebration with your family on August 2nd. Your outstanding support and dedication to this administration is benefiting Americans across the nation. I also want to express to you how essential your role has been in helping to bridge our country's diverse communities, your efforts to open lines of communication between our administration and the Taiwanese American community are very much appreciated. Again, thank you for your support for a job well done. Then we get to 207 in the exhibit list, uh, which is Johnny Chung uh, to Betty Curry, Secretary to the President, reference letter from the Democratic National Committee. Thank you. Uh, now, here's the Democratic National Committee one. Here, Mr. Johnny Chung, Chairman, CEO, Automated Intelligence Systems, so forth. Dear Johnny, thank you for stopping by my office. I really enjoyed meeting your guests. You are to be commended for your efforts to build a bridge between the people of China and the United States. I want to express my appreciation to you for being friend, great supporter of the Democratic National Committee. Good luck on your trip to China. Keep me informed. Then we get to uh, the White House memorandum of Janice Enright, Office of Chief of Staff, Mr. Panetta, to Anthony Lake, the National Security Advisor. That's exhibit number 251. Dated July 24, 95. I've received a telephone call this morning, uh, says Janice Enright, from Bobby Watson, Chief of Staff, Democratic National Committee, concerning the release of Harry Wu. Apparently, Johnny Chung, a DNC uh, trustee, is traveling with a group of people to China, meeting with the President of China this week. His mission is to negotiate the release of Harry Wu. Now, was the National Security Council uh, and you as an Asian expert there and a Chinese uh, China expert, were they ever consulted that uh, Johnny Chung was interested in a mission to China to help Harry Wu? The, the they being, I'm sorry. Was the NSC uh, staff? And no, it was not. Harry, you don't recall this then. Now, what it says here is Mr. Watson wanted to alert us that Mr. Chung plans to represent to the President of China that he's sanctioned by President Clinton in his efforts to get Mr. Wu released. He bases this representation on the fact that he recently saw the president during his trip to California, mentioned it to him, I believe in a photo line, what he was doing in this regard. Apparently the president was supporting. To that extent, it's unclear, but nevertheless, it is being construed as a validation that he'll be the representative that way to the president of China. Then we have a July 31st, 1995 memorandum from you to Anthony Lake, and that's exhibit 252, and you say, re the Democratic National Committee trustee Johnny Chung in the Harry Wu case, this memorandum also covers a response uh, to package 5908, request for presidential credentials letter for Johnny Chung. Memo from Leon Panetta's office, uh, and then you give a tab A there on uh, Chung in his intent to try to get Harry Wu released is very troubling in part because I was not able to contact the Democratic National Committee in time to get them to discourage Chung from involving himself in this diplomatically difficult, high-stakes issue. Does that ring any memories of course. with you at all? How did you feel about that? Were you happy? Were you displeased, uh, et cetera? I was quite concerned. Yeah. And what were your reasons for concern? My reasons were, as I indicated before, that, that I was concerned that an effort that had been ongoing since uh, Mr. Wu's arrest uh, to get him released in the most, uh, in the quickest and most appropriate way might have been compromised or might have confused uh, the Chinese government uh, by the uh, intervention uh, of Mr. Chung. Uh, and, and I thought that, that, uh, that, that the DNC credentials letter uh, was even more than I would have liked him to have uh, in terms of his own travel to China. Well, when they uh, had that letter that just has Bill Clinton at the top of the stationery, uh, was that ever uh, discussed by the uh, staff of the NSC? That's October 3rd, 1994, and that's just really thanks, and I assume that came out of the Democratic National Committee, but I'm not positive. I don't know the uh, origin of the document, sir. really a political letter. Anyhow, you say here in this July 31st memo, I believe Chung means well, something of a self-appointed ambassador of goodwill. Now, what did uh, Mr. Lake uh, do about that? 
the gentleman's time has uh, expired. We'll let him answer the question. Mr. Lake called me later on in the evening after he received that uh, that package, that uh, that memorandum from me, and asked if it was my view that we should try to contact either Mr. Chung uh, or the U.S. Embassy in Beijing to try and forestall or prevent uh, Mr. Chung from from engaging uh, in any efforts on that uh, on that supposed mission. I replied that I didn't know where he was. I didn't know when he was going to arrive. I indicated that I doubted that he would see the president of China uh, and that it would be very difficult and might even further complicate efforts uh, if, if we uh, made strong uh, efforts to try and prevent him from seeing anybody. So I thought it would, there was probably little we could do. I thank you. We might pursue some more of this later, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kincharski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've just listened, uh, uh, Mr. Sonier, to your comments, and it strikes me that you're, you seem to be a man that believes in doing everything through the uh, normal order of things. There's a book of procedure, and you follow the, uh, the, the process. Is that correct? I try to be. Uh, it, have you dealt in uh, uh, political life as a non-professional? Uh, what did you do before you went with the NSA? Uh, before I went to the NSC, I worked at, this, at the, uh, the National Intelligence Council and prior to that, the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay, but you haven't really been in politics, have you? No, sir. Uh, would you be surprised to know that uh, members of Congress occasionally uh, will arrange visits, private visits to heads of states around the world through their own communications without having any uh, contact through the State Department or the embassy in the area or anybody but private sector individuals? I'm aware that that's happened. Well, why would you assume that um, uh, uh, an American uh, of Taiwanese ancestry doing business and having put on <laughs> quite a promotion, I'm impressed with uh, Mr. Chung's promotion, may not just uh, convince the, uh, uh, some high-ranking officials and political operatives in China that if this would affect the business in some way, this is something that should be handled. Why would you conclude that that wouldn't be strong or a possibility? I'm not sure I understand the thrust of your question, sir. Well, it, 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 I, I know that some members of the committee uh, are shocked and think that it's impossible for what Mr. Chong may have done or could have done to have an impact. But I have seen that type of impact occur between private individuals and political individuals of other countries in dealing with uh, very touchy questions. I can give you a perfect example myself. Are you speaking of the Harry Wu case? Yes, I'm talking the Harry Wu case that, that, that it wouldn't seem unreasonable to me that if a, a well-connected, active American Chinese businessman sat down with someone in the hi a hierarchy of uh, uh, the Chinese government or the business community said, you know, you're really making it very difficult for us to uh, try and develop business relationships here because you have this political prisoner and the people in the bureaucracy don't seem to be paying attention or sensitive to the problem. And I'm telling you as a businessman that this is, uh, uh, we don't know what your political problems are, but as a businessman, you're causing us a, a disconnect here. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a reasonable thing to happen? Certainly there are uh, circumstances in which that might be true. My concern in this particular case was one that Tr Mr. Chung seemed to have indicated that he was going to represent himself as, uh, as somebody on a mission from the president, uh, which was certainly not the case. Uh, it was also the case that Mr. Chung did not know what the administration had been doing to try to gain Mr. Wu's release, uh, and that but his idea of what was appropriate might not at all be consistent with ours. What if, he, what, what if, in fact, he wasn't trying to really represent himself as an emissary from the president, but merely that he knew the president or was a friend of the president, quote, friend of the president? Uh, uh, would you still try to stop him? Would you think he'd have no impact? Let me give you an example. I, I, was, I referred to it earlier. Look, right after uh, uh, the Polish situation, I was on a CODEL, an official congressional trip to Eastern Europe, and uh, the members of that CODEL wanted to have an opportunity to meet with the political leadership, uh, head of Solidarity, Lech Walesa. And at that time, he was an unofficial, unelected individual in Poland and attempting to consolidate political influence. And regardless of how they tried, they couldn't get an audience with him. 
I happen to know a friend that was a businessman that had uh, uh, since become an American citizen and that he knew Luck was, or anyway, he purported to know him to me. And so since I was going to be over there, I said, you know, I'd like to try and have a meeting with him. This is the same individual who said, look, if you ever go to Rome, uh, I'd like to take you to meet the Pope. I didn't go to Rome, and I didn't think I'd get in to see the Pope that easily. But I happened to call this fellow, just by chance, and I said, look, I'm going to be in New York. I'm going to break away from this trip for a day. I'd like to fly up to Gdansk and have a meeting. He called me back in 25 minutes, and he said, you arrive at the airport. The car will pick you up. They will take you to Solidarity Air Headquarters, and the uh, leader will be at your disposal for any number of hours. And you can select a group of four people, which I did, another member of Congress myself, we flew into the Gdansk, and we spent a very enlightened four hours with Lech Walesa. The, the ambassador of Poland couldn't get us there. The State Department, Secretary of State couldn't get us there, and no one in the Congress of the United States could get us there. Now, that's a personal experience I've had. I, since I, I, I told you a story about the Pope, since that time, uh, many of my friends have taken up this friend. And by golly, they do go and spend time with the Pope. Uh, so people in private life do sometimes have connections or appearances of being able to still the waters. And I, I you know, I, I, there's a sequence here that you could say is coincidental, could be a seizure of opportunity, someone trying to get in on a good thing and taking advantage of it, because we are dealing with someone here that, quote, is a promoter. Uh, he, uh, uh, but there is also an outside possibility that the uh, Chinese government and Chinese business community would take more uh, a stock in something a Chinese-American businessman would be telling them than all officialdom, who they deal with on a regular basis and may not be impressed with. Uh, haven't you had those experiences down there in serving? I, I readily concede the point that unofficial and informal communications uh, can sometimes have a very beneficial effect on the development of relations. Uh, in this particular instance, I was not persuaded that, that Mr. Chung was, uh, was operating on the same, wing, same wavelength as the rest of us, uh, that he fully understood the complexity and nuance of American policy, or that indeed he had been given such a mission by the President. And so I thought it was appropriate uh, for me to raise a warning flag uh, for Mr. Lake, and that is what I did. But it, the but gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of comments you made earlier. Uh, in response to one of the questions, you said that you did not know that Johnny Chung was an agent of the communist government. True? Both of you, I believe, said that. I have no basis on which to make such a judgment. Ms. Darby, you said that as well. Do you have yes. any basis on which to say he is not an agent? Similarly, no. He's that an American not. citizen. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sutinger, you defined a hustler, I think, very appropriately, someone who has an agenda that may not be readily apparent. Is, did I hear you correctly? Yes, sir. Uh, did you have an opportunity or a cause to uh, speculate as to what Mr. Chung's hidden agenda might be? I did not have any specific uh, indications of his agenda other than as I outlined it in the email, which was based upon an earlier conversation. Uh, in your, uh, in that email, uh, you made the comment that you felt that the president uh, might not wish to be associated with uh, some of these business undertakings. Do you recall that statement? Yes, I do. Uh, what, what speculation were you assessing there? How did you come to that judgment, and what kinds of business undertakings were you concerned uh, might not be appropriate for the president to be associated with? It was really a generic uh, kind of comment on my part. As I indicated earlier in the email, I was concerned that Mr. Chung would do this repeatedly uh, and would bring a, 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 a series, a sequence uh, of individuals in to see the president. And I certainly had no confidence that we would be able to verify that all of them were, were bona fide uh, uh, officials or engaged in legitimate business operations. I was just concerned with protecting the president from future uh, problems that might exist because of the association with Mr. Chung. So you were concerned where the, the situation might lead rather than where you could definitively say it was at that moment? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, earlier you talked about uh, the recent uh, 
separation in mainland China, the PRC, between the structure of the political party and the business uh, uh, business side of the of the society, uh, trying to provide the business uh, undertakings with a certain uh, freedom from the political apparatus. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, is my understanding correct, however, that ultimately it all does come back to the party, that indeed any indigenous Chinese business undertaking not only is concerned but ultimately responsible to the political structure? I think uh, as, as a general statement, yes, that's correct. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Darby, how long were you at NSC? From February of 93 until August of 95. During your, your time there, how many uh, opportunities did you have to uh, do a vet such as this where you were asked to look over uh, a particular uh, appropriate uh, individuals and make a recommendation as to whether or not the president should be associated in this instance with the pictures? Um, this situation, I don't recall ever having a, a similar counterpart uh, during my tenure at the NSC. Again, this was an after-the-fact request for guidance, and, and the standard practice was that we were consulted prior to any um, events like this taking place. Um, as I said earlier, you know, my contacts with the President's office or senior White House staff would have been maybe four to eight times a month, maybe. It's, it's really hard to say. It varied a lot. Were, were your recommendations generally uh, accepted? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say in particular that they were my recommendations. I was not a policy specialist at the NSC. Um, I relied on the guidance of uh, the policy staff of the NSC. Uh, and if something required a real policy decision, I would refer it to Nancy Soderberg or another senior person on the staff. You made a recommendation in this case? It was more of a personal recommendation rather than a, there were no real foreign policy concerns that I could see. Um, Johnny Chung did not appear from Bob Sutinger's email to pose a national security risk, so it really wasn't so much a question of whether, uh, for foreign policy reasons, the was this, should not be delivered. I understand. Was this the first time you had to make a personal recommendation during your time there? I really don't recall. Do you have any uh, observations about this case where your personal recommendation was not apparently observed? About this case? Yes. I, I do not know what the disposition of the photos was, so I, I really couldn't comment. I see. I, I have a, a very brief amount of time left. Uh, Ms. Soderberg, let me uh, return to you very briefly. Uh, there seems to be a lot of concern about uh, the situation where people you describe as freelancers go out and undertake certain missions unto themselves, and I think we'd all agree that that does happen very frequently, whether they are officials of government or whether they are private business people. But I believe I'm hearing you say, at least from your perspective, this one was a particular concern and somewhat unusual in that there was a national political party providing a, a letter of introduction or at least some form of credential. Did I hear you correctly uh, listing that as an unusual concern on your part? I, w I was concerned that, that there was a credential in the form of a letter from the DNC. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Fatah? Mr. Chairman, I think we've exhausted our five minutes on the first round, and you still have a member who has not yet uh, used their first you, round. You, you do have five minutes because you spoke on the 30-minute cycle. Oh, if, then let if you, if you, I mean, you know, you, you like to Well, talk. thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you insist, let me... Uh, Let me proceed forward on this. And, and I do want to say that, that um, not, notwithstanding uh, our legitimate uh, interactions, uh, I think that there is one issue that I, I think that we could share in, and that is that this committee, even though it spent uh, a few million dollars in the beginning of its investigation, we have a number of intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies that have multi-billion dollar budgets. And if there's information that the FBI or the CIA or the National Security Agency or anyone has that could be useful to the purposes that the chairman has outlined uh, in terms of trying to filter out whether or not there was foreign uh, 
uh, illegal foreign activities vis-a-vis -vis our election, that information should be brought forward. And plus, it may help us that if, if with all of their ability, they haven't found any, you know, then maybe we could put this to rest sooner rather than later. So either way, it may be of some use. But I do want to get to the point that was raised, and that is that under questioning from the gentleman from Georgia, he, he got you to admit that at all times there are foreign governments who from time to time might have or may want us to have a different viewpoint about a certain matter. And they have very legitimate and appropriate ways in which they can communicate their viewpoints to our government. I guess the question really is under this uh, investigation is we're trying to determine since there has been um, allegations made that the Chinese government wanted to influence uh, members of Congress. They were concerned about these uh, votes on the most favored nation or whatever the case may be, or their relationships generally with the Congress that they wanted to um, have an impact. In terms of this matter with the photos and with Johnny Chung, is there any information that somehow that, that this had something to do with the People's Republic of China either legally or illegally or inappropriately trying to influence the Congress of the United States? With all due respect, Congressman, uh, your question takes me somewhat beyond the scope of, your uh, of, of what I've been asked to testify about. Uh, the simple answer to your last question is I, uh, I have no way of knowing. Okay. Well, I have no way of knowing either because we, we're really hung up on the fact that these gentlemen got into this radio address and that they got in through um, uh, Johnny Chung's entree through the DNC and that they got a picture taken. And then there's a lot of question about whatever happened to the picture, whether they got the picture or they didn't. And we've been going back over this for at least two days now. Uh, and we're not even clear whether or not the pictures were ever released um, to the gentleman uh, involved. But it doesn't seem to me to have anything to do with the central question of our investigation. So I realize that you may be at a loss, but I'm also at a loss. And it is. Um, it may be useful, I guess, to, to just run through it one more time. You had nothing to do, Ms. Darby, with approving these uh, gentlemen to go into the radio address. No, I did not. You were not present at the radio address. No, I was not. Your only responsibility in this matter was that you were asked by Mrs. Crawf Ms. Crawford whether or not, since the president had raised a concern, whether or not these photos should actually be released. And you said, look, we got a lot of other important things to do around here. Why don't you err on the side of caution and not release the photos? And you sent a memo that said, look, you don't see any lasting harm in the photos being released, and neither one of you have any idea what the actual disposition of the photos are at this time. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, I, I want to thank you for your presence here today, and I want to thank the chairman uh, for uh, yielding me our due uh, five minutes. We won't even use it all. We'll yield it back. Thank you, Mr. Patak. Thank you. Mr. Souter. Uh, yesterday in our testimony, we heard from Nancy Hernreich that apparently at least one of the photos was released. Does that bother you, Ms. Darby? Uh, I wasn't aware that there was more than one photo. Uh, it, it doesn't bother me, as I say. I don't think there were foreign policy implications um, that Bob made me aware of in this email about the photos being released. Is it typical that when you would express uh, caution and suggest that it might not be wise to release them, that the White House would release them anyway? Uh, I really have no idea. I didn't uh, usually, I didn't get follow-up information on whether they took my advice or not. But again, generally, it was not my advice as a NSC uh, foreign policy specialist. Well, it was certainly Mr. Sutinger's uh, email as well to expressing concerns. Uh, do you know very many other times that you may have expressed uh, concerns regarding certain photos to the White House? I don't recall any other specific incidents, sir. So this may be, in fact, the only case where you expressed concern to the White House about a photo and they didn't listen? Uh, I'm not sure that they didn't listen. Um, if, if indeed the testimony yesterday was accurate that at least one photo has been released, then they didn't follow your caution, at least. Would that not be a fair statement? Again, that was my personal caution. and It wasn't based on any foreign policy implications I saw in turning the photograph over. Um, I wanted to ask you one other question as well. Um, Clearly there was a kind of a flurry of activity here around uh, April 7th because Mr. Chung was coming in. Had they requested this earlier, uh, an opinion from your office? Was it sitting on a desk uh, among other requests or 
why was this almost a month later? Um, I'm not aware of any other requests relating to this other than the one that we've been discussing and is reflected in this email. Um, but I think the, the sense of urgency was probably because the photographs take several weeks to be developed and they probably had just been developed and, and Johnny Chung was coming in the following day to pick them up. So you're saying it isn't correct that the White House contacted you right after the photo to do a background check about releasing it? There was a, certainly the implication under testimony here that there was an immediate contact to your office rather than a delay of almost a month. There wasn't a contact that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Sutinger, um, I think your uh, email was, um, which is Exhibit 198, was very informative. In other words, you said you didn't have any direct evidence, but you expressed uh, future concerns, um, uh, which I would hope that uh, any White House would take seriously coming from the National Security Council. One of the um, uh, statements that you made uh, to Mr. Uh, McHugh was is that while you didn't have any evidence that these people were uh, agents, you didn't have any evidence that necessarily they weren't. I, I heard you say earlier, too, that you felt they were relatively low level or less uh, powerful. Um, wouldn't it be true that if somebody wanted to try to start to influence a system, that in fact if they just sent more powerful uh, people or people who had more of a history, that in fact you would have caught them? And wouldn't that argue not that they are, but that this is one way you could do it? In other words, it would have flagged your system had they been higher up, why would that argument not be a concern as well? I'm really not in a position to speculate about, about whether there was a conspiracy afoot uh, in this case uh, to, to utilize a photo opportunity toward, toward uh, broader purposes. Well, My understanding as I answered the email was that there was no uh, national security concern with regard to the individuals involved and that remains my view. My, my point, however, is, is that had they had a, a record or been more influential, you might have said definitely no to the photos? I was not in a position... Or your advice... Oh, I see, I see what, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult for me to speculate on, on, on what might have taken place had circumstances been different. I responded to the circumstances as I understood them at the time. But isn't that your, what your email does? It's a speculation. You say that... There could be other uh, individuals. There may be times uh, would be ones the president would support. Also, predict could you know you're concerned about how this could not only go uh, long term with Johnny Chung, but how this process could be misused. My concern was really in in, in making sure that the president uh, was protected more from uh, kind of perhaps shady business deals than from an effort to to influence his opinion uh, in any way, shape, or form. Don't you think that when they contacted the, your office, they were concerned about national security things, not just uh, whether or not they were... You mean uh, when Mr. Chung uh, contacted my office? Uh, when the White House asked uh, about uh, using these pictures, do you think they were asking you whether or not uh, you, uh, they wanted your advice on how business deals were going, or do you think they were asking your advice on national security matters? I, I really can't speculate on what prompted them to, to raise the concern or in what context. I, I responded to the question, uh, again, as I indicated earlier, uh, from a national security perspective, but in my comments vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Chung, I was really thinking more of, of repeat performances that might have a different cast of characters. Do you get questions about uh, businessmen on a routine basis, or are most of the requests that come to you related to national security? Um, there have not been that many. This is a, you're, you're referring to the request for vetting? Yes. Uh, most of them involve uh, individuals who are not known to be government officials. In other words, they would be more businessmen and private individuals, academics and so forth. But you're betting for national security, not for hustling? That's correct. Um, because, uh, and it's not, uh, it, it's hard to be in the position of not wanting to question individuals' integrity, yet based on what we saw this morning, uh, that in fact we do have agents of influence trying to influence things and that some of that information was withheld. We need to be as aggressive as possible in asking some of these questions and laying this out as this hearing goes through. I yield back. Would, would the gentleman just yield for one second? Uh, I know his time is up. Well, the gentleman's uh, uh, time has expired. That Mr. Waxman's the next. Why don't you uh, get time for Mr. Otherwise, Waxman? I just wanted to c correct the record. I think the gentleman mistakenly misspoke in that the, the testimony yesterday for Mrs. Heinrich was not that the photos had been released. In fact, her testimony uh, several times yesterday was that she was not at all 
it was not at all her belief that the photos were ever released. She did not have any knowledge that they had been released. So I just want to correct the record as to whether or not these photos were ever released, and we're going to continue to search for the truth in this regard. My understanding was one photo, photos, I, if I said photos, it was a mistake. One photo. Yeah. I, I'd be claiming my time just also for the record. The only thing we had in the newspaper today was that the FBI didn't give some information to this committee, and I think it's a big leap from that to say that we learned about spying uh, because we didn't learn about that. We may, but no one knows that at this point. So we don't know whether the photos were ever released. We do know Mr. Sutinger was asked whether they should be released, and he said he didn't think any lasting damage would be on, uh, done to U.S. foreign policy if they uh, were uh, released to Johnny Chung. I want to yield uh, the balance of my time uh, to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Waxman. Um, first of all, let me take a moment. Uh, this hearing, I think, will be winding down very shortly. But I want to thank you both for your service to the United States of America. Um, I know that this is not the most pleasant uh, situation for you, but I think you symbolize the very best that America has to offer. And I do mean that. It was just, uh, someone just said a few minutes ago Mr. Sudinger, that uh, you were a person, I think it was Mr. Kondorski, who said that you were a person that went by the books. And I think the same thing can be said of you, Ms. Darby. And I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of all of us. Um, and I'm sorry that you have to go through this, but this is, I guess, a part of the process. Um, Mr. Sudinger, I want to also say to you that I really admire you for your ability to try to kind of figure out who's a hustler. Uh, who's a hustler and who's not. It is interesting that Mr. Chung is an equal opportunity hustler um, because he has a book. I don't know if you've seen this document, but it's automated. It's called Automated Intelligence Systems, Inc. I think this was his corporation. Are you, have you seen this? It's a, it's a brochure. And I think your worst fears about what a hustler does is epitomized in this document because he not only has pictures of him. It's, it's full of pictures, by the way. And he not only has pictures of him and the president, but he has a picture of him and our illustrious speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. He has a picture of him and uh, the, the governor of California, uh, Pete Wilson. He has a picture here of uh, him and the majority leader, uh, former majority leader and former presidential uh, Republican candidate, uh, Bob Dole. So he really uh, made sure that he did exactly, I mean, and I admire you for figuring this out, that this guy is, was a hustler and he, he was equal opportunity. And it's very interesting. And I also want to note something else. I was wondering if you, Exhibit 215, are you familiar with this? This is a document uh, which is uh, apparently from, it's dated uh, November 22nd, uh, 1995. And it is uh, apparently f to a Lori Weiner from a Kathleen Hennessy. And I take it that this is from the photography uh, shop uh, in the White House. Are you familiar with that document? I have not seen this document before, sir. Uh, well, it let me just read it. Um, it says, uh, as of 11 95 per Bob McNeely. Do you know who that is? I do not. OK. We will not honor requests from Johnny Chung uh, he has been a uh, CEO of uh, this corporation. He has been improperly using the photo of the business people and the president. Bob suggests telling him the photos were ordered and sent out and cannot be reordered. <laughs> he has been asking through the West Wing office, but he might find our office at, uh, office at some point. Thanks, Kathleen. And so, again, I go back to uh, your fears and your concerns, and it appears that the photo office in the White House, uh, again, later on, uh, f found a way to kind of block uh, this hustler that you talked about. And yesterday was brought up, I, and I don't know whether you reviewed the testimony yesterday on, uh, on the uh, C-SPAN, but it is also interesting to go back to this whole question of the equal opportunity hustler uh, in a letter dated April 6, 1994, but from all people, the governor of the state of California. Uh, Pete Wilson, and I just want to reiterate it so that the record will be clear that he not only was trying to pimp the president, but he was trying to also do the same thing with Mr. Wilson, Governor Wilson. 
And I just want this is again to be reiterated. It says, uh, it's addressed to Mr. Chung. It says, Dear Mr. Chung, it is my understanding that you have been nominated as Entrepreneur of the Year. Congratulations. It is a well-deserved recognition. Uh, my communications and press offices inform me that you and your team have performed in an outstanding manner. Your good work, in turn, has enabled my office to serve the people of California effectively and efficiently, especially during California's recent disasters. Again, you have my appreciation for a job well done, and that's signed by the governor of the great state of California, Pete Wilson. And so, again, I, I, I know that it may have sounded like there was a little bit of sarcasm, but I do admire both of you for what you've done. I thank you for, for being the good employees that you have been for the United States of America. And again, uh, on behalf of all of us, I thank you for your testimony today. I yield uh, back to the ranking member. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, I have the last five minutes, and I will yield my time uh, to Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a, a major difference, uh, just uh, for the record, uh, between uh, what was just uh, stated with regard to the governor, former governor, whatever, of California. Uh, he was not the recipient of uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars of Mr. Chung's largesse. Uh, that makes a, a big difference. Uh, going back to uh, uh, Sinopec, uh, this is not a small corporation, is it, Mr. Sutinger? Uh, is, is it not the fourth largest petrochemical company in the world? Uh, with I, uh, if, if that's information that you've derived from other sources, I have no means of, I mean, it is a large it is uh, a state. It is. It's a very large state entity. That's correct. Commercial entity. Is that correct? My understanding. Dealing is. in the in the billions of, of dollars. Dealing in the billions of dollars. I would assume so. The oil business does. Uh, yes, take and, lots I think of money. we can can assume that. Particularly since in October of 1997, uh, Sinopec announced an agreement with Exxon and Aramco uh, for uh, joint feasibility study for a refinery and petrochemical complex in East China's coastal province of Fujian which will involve a total investment of $3 billion. So somewhere along the line, uh, Sinopec has done real well. Uh, Sinopec was, uh, as you all may or may not know, uh, the, uh, the corporation uh, that wanted the meeting with Energy Secretary O'Leary, uh, which, at which uh, time Mr. Chung uh, was directed to con contribute $25,000 so that that meeting could take place. That $25,000 uh, was given to Africare. Ms. O'Leary's favorite charity uh, at her direction, picked up by an employee of the Energy Department. Uh, so there's a lot more at stake here than just a, a two-bit hustler uh, and a few photographs. There are billions of dollars at stake here and the national security interests of at least two of the major powers of the world, the United States uh, and China, uh, and also uh, Saudi Arabia. That was also part of what Sinopec was after. Uh, so it still uh, leads me uh, to uh, uh, scratch my head and figure out uh, why no red lights uh, went off. Uh, now, I know that uh, the emails we've been talking about here post-date by a month the uh, meeting at, at the White House, but we now know that there was an awful lot that took place subsequent to that, such as the uh, payment uh, uh, at, at the direction of Ms. O'Leary, uh, a number of other uh, efforts by Sinopec and by Mr. Chung involving perhaps Ron Brown and others, according to uh, letters uh, that, that are in exhibits here. Uh, and uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Sutinger, uh, if you had before you all of the information that we now have, uh, and if you had this information uh, not on April 7th of 95, but on March 7th of 95, uh, would your attitude uh, have been the same in responding to uh, Ms. Darby's email? With all due respect, Congressman, you're asking me again to speculate on um, yes, sir, I, am I would do in different circumstances. And it is very difficult for me to, uh, to, to do that uh, certainly, Why? given the way the information has been, uh, the, the way that you have characterized the information. Well, char char you can characterize it any way you'd like. All I'm saying is, is there anything that uh, you have become aware of, uh, or just based on your review of who these gentlemen were, do you still believe them to be essentially two-bit players that have no you know, real interest uh, beyond just getting a picture with the president that would cause you to have given a different recommendation? if you had had that information before you on March 7th. Yes, I am asking you to speculate. Again, my, my, uh, my uh, remarks at the time uh, were based upon my understanding of what constitutes a photo opportunity. Uh, 
I'm a, that I is understand a handshake, that. a friendly word, and and uh, and then head for the door. So it is not my belief that that there was anything politically significant likely to transpire during the period of a photo opportunity. So I even had I been asked in advance, I don't think I would have changed my view. Well, then 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 I take back some of the nice things I said earlier. I think that uh, I think that your uh, your work and and your and your statements indicate that that there that there is. Uh, not an effort to really serve the national interests of this country. Well, you understand even in your email that there was a political effort here by contributors uh, to seek access to the president. We now know that some of those contributors were uh, one of things involving billions of dollars from this country that would benefit the communist Chinese government uh, at, at a minimum in a major economic way. And you're still saying that that would not cause you to uh, to recommend uh, that, uh, that that they not have access to the president. I'm. I must admit, I'm just flabbergasted. I yield back. I would certainly. The gentleman yield. yield. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you yield some of your available Mr. time? Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. Horn uh, needs some time, and I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Horn. If I have any left, of course I'll yield to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one question, because I'm curious as to the relationship with Mr. Chung that crossed your desk before the April 7th memorandum, in which you say, having recently. Uh, counseled a young intern from the First Lady's office who had been offered a, quote, dream job, unquote, by Johnny Chung. I think he should be treated with a pinch of suspicion. Now, we read into the record earlier the memorandum you wrote to the President's National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake, on July 31st, 1995. I'm curious, what came before April 7th that you remember? What came after July 31st, 1995? that involved Mr. Chung that you remember? Or that's, is this all that uh, you were involved in? Obviously, you counseled this intern before April 7th. That helped lead you to a conclusion about uh, Mr. Chung. Uh, what happened? Anything else before April 7th? Anything else after July 31st? Anything in between? As I indicated, uh, I had some phone calls from Mr. Chung uh, that that uh, that caused me to uh, to be concerned about his own agenda. Uh, again, I can't. I did not put them on the record at the time, and they are not available either to my recollection or uh, to any other record. The meeting with uh, with the intern from the first lady's office is likewise not on the record. Uh, she called me in the morning, uh, said that somebody had suggested she come to talk to me, um, and and I did so. She described. Uh, a position that she was being offered by Mr. Chung uh, that caused me uh, some concern that uh, appeared she was going to be uh, hired as someone whose principal responsibilities would be to provide some sort of escort for some of these individuals coming into town and that her f service or at that point former service with the First Lady's office would also be used as an entree to get some of these individuals to see uh, people in the First Lady's office. Uh, I found that to be uh, uh, something that aroused my suspicion. Uh, she was about my daughter's age, and so I, I counseled her that that uh, the jobs that seem to be too good to be true uh, usually are not true, and that uh, she ought to find out as much information as she could about what was being offered and what was going to be expected of her before she accepted any kind of a dream job. Uh, as I say, that sort of uh, uh, colored my, uh, my perception of what Mr. Chung was up to to a significant degree. In, uh, after July 31st, uh, according to your question, I have had uh, no contact uh, with anything to do with Mr. Chung uh, other than what I've been able to read in the newspapers. Thank you the, very much. Gen uh, all time has expired. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, both of you for being with us today. We appreciate your candor. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully we won't have to bother you again but if we do, we'll try to make sure we accommodate your time. Uh, per uh, our agreement with the minority, uh, I ask unanimous consent that the depositions of Ari Swiller, Dick Morris, and Eric Silden be made public and without objection so ordered. The continuation of the meeting with uh, Johnny Chung will be in the lounge of the committee. So those who want to attend and uh, participate in uh, that uh, discussion uh, will go there immediately upon adjournment. This committee stands adjourned.
Следующее. The House Government Reform and Oversight Committee is investigating campaign fundraising during last year's federal elections. Chairman Burton plans to continue hearings over the next few weeks. The committee's counterpart, the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee, has already wrapped up its hearings and will release a report on its findings next month. If you have a computer, you can see the campaign fundraising hearings online. Most days, the committee meets at 10 a.m. If you have a 28-8 modem, you can watch the hearings live as they happen.